Welcome to Wine Soundtrack South Africa. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities and passions. Hello friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Marina Kahlo and today I'm sitting with Johan Delport from Waverley Hills. Welcome Johan. Can you tell me a bit about yourself? Hi, thanks for for the opportunity. Yeah, so um, yeah, I grew up in the Boerland um, area, so in the in the winelands. So I had a, a love for wine making and farming my whole life. Yeah, so that's why I started up in the in the Worcester area, and then after um, after school I went to study to study um, wine making at Stellenbosch. Yeah, then my my career started in the in the wine industry. Um, at a few different wineries, I started out at the KWV. Was my well, I had my first sort of experience of winemaking, and I moved on to to bigger cooperative wineries like Porta Wine Cellar, and then up to what's now known as Pioneer School of Wines. Yeah, before I ended up at Waverly Hills Organic Wines, where I'm currently. I've been there for the past. Um, 13 and a half years or 14 seasons that I've been making wine there. So yeah, it's been a good journey and a nice experience so far. That certainly sounds like you grew up in, in, in wine country and, and continued to really live the lifestyle. That's really awesome. Tell me more about Waverly Hills Organic. Where is it located? Where can I find it? Waverly Hills is in the Tilbach Appalachian. Um, we in sort of the northeast corner of of the of the Talbach Valley. Um, so yeah, Talbach is, is a small appellation. I think only about one percent of the country's vineyards are planted in, in the old Talbach area. So we have, I think, the smallest appellation in the country, I would imagine. Um, but it's with a long history. I think the first recorded farms and wine plantings already in the 1700s in, in, in the Tilbach Valley, so the, the tradition of winemaking has been there for, for many, many years. Um, yeah, so we part of the, of, of, of the Tilbach area. Um, Tilbach, of course, is well known for making very good quality wines over the years, especially um, varieties like Shiraz, Pinotas, your other um, rounds, type of wines like Grenache and these type of wines normally do very well in our area. Yes, Tilbach is also famous for a big earthquake that happened there a number of years ago. Um, and it's it's really a beautiful little town if uh, you ever get a chance to visit. Uh, tell me, Johan, how many hectares of land do you farm? The total farm of, of Waverley is about 100 hectares. Um, a lot of it is, is a mountain area and um, also protected indigenous Feinbos, um areas as well. We farm at about um, 50 hectares of vineyards and another we also have um, olives as part of our production. It's about nine hectares of olives. So that is what our um, uh, farming areas um, made out of. Yeah. And tell me about the wine. Um, how much volume do you produce annually and what type of wines do you make? Yeah, we, we, we produce about 120,000 bottles a year, um, focusing on, on red cultivars. It's more um, conducive to the hotter, drier climate of the Tilbach area. So about 80% of our production is red wines. We focus mainly on on round style wines, um, Shiraz, Grenache, Mouvedre, Vionier and the blends thereof. Um, so that is our main focus, but but we have a big range of wines. We actually make everything. We we also actually have a couple of seek made from Chardonnay, so we have a Blanc de Blanc. We make other um, dry white wines like a Sauvignon Blanc Semillon blend, for instance, um, and a Pinot Grigio. So yeah, we've got a big range of wines, up through the whole range of red wines as well, different blends. We go for Pinotage. Um, we even make uh, dessert wine as well. And then, yes, our, our sort of our flagship wine, the flagship wine of Waverly is our SMV Shiraz Mouvedre Vionia blend. It's big volumes and it's a good quality wine. It's a very successful wine of ours. So one sort of our flagship wine. Then we also what something out of the norm. We also make a no add a sulfite wine from Cabernet Sauvignon, preservative free wine, especially for people with 
allergic reactions to, to sulfur. Uh, it's also a very popular wine of ours. Um, yeah, because we, of course all our wines are organic, so that also also goes well with our rest of our organic principles. And then there are another special wine that we do have is a Marcelan. It's the, um, the only Marcelan in South Africa at this stage. 2020 was the first vintage and we released it at the end of last year, of October 2021 it was released. Very successful so far, I must say. Nearly sold out already. Um, so yeah, that's very exciting for us to to when we started with the whole project, the, sourcing the, the wines from France and had it um, multiplied in South Africa and then planting the, the first vineyard was planted in 2016. So yeah, we're fortunate to have our first vintage in 2020. So yeah, we, we're excited about the future of Marjolan as well. I'll definitely have to get my hands on a bottle of that before it sells out. Um, Tell me something, obviously we can buy Waverly Hills Organic here in South Africa and at the tasting room. Where can our international listeners uh, expect to find uh, Waverly Hills wines? Yeah, we've got markets basically all over the world. Our main markets are in the UK, Switzerland, Denmark is basically our three biggest markets also Germany so mainly the European market um, and then but also small uh, quantities in a lot of other countries um, in China um, the Seychelles is a good market for us Mauritius yeah so um, but yeah mainly we'll find this in, in the European countries for export but our biggest market is South Africa about 60% of our um, sales are, are local in South Africa at this stage. But yeah, we are you know, also in the process of expanding our um, export markets all over the world as far as we can. Because organic is sort of a, a big thing now, not only for wine, but in all foods. Um, but the organic sector in wine is also growing very fast. So there's a lot of interest in organic wine. So yeah, it's a big opportunity for, for us as well. And you were one of the first organic producers in South Africa, um, considering there aren't actually that many. Um, so it is great that, that you one of the flag bearers for organic wine uh, from South Africa. Moving on to you, uh, Johan, what is your first real memory of wine? Uh, can you remember as a child, perhaps? Yeah, I remember. Uh, I have told the story quite a few times. I remember I was five years old, um, and I had a sip of my father's glass of wine at the Parai or something. I remember it was Slanguk Stien, uh, by way back then, in the 1970s. And after I tasted, if I had a sip of wine, I told my father I wanted to become a winemaker. But since or between then, and I actually decided I wanted to become a lot of other things as well. But yeah, that was my first memory of, of wine. <laughs> You mentioned wanting to maybe become a whole bunch of other things in between. What are one of those things that you wanted to become? I think, yeah, when I was in primary school, I wanted to become a stuntman. It was the one thing. Um, and then <laughs> later on, when I, I guess when I got a bit more serious about things, I considered journalism quite um, um, earnestly. So that was something I was also set out on doing. But yeah. Then I, after school, I went for my military service, and then after that, I had to make a decision. And I guess, then I wanted to stay in the Western Cape. It was the biggest reason why I decided on wine making. Fair enough. For you, if you went into journalism, you could have been doing these interviews instead of me. <laughs> Tell me, do you recall um, a particularly strong memory of a special bottle of wine that you experienced that really stands out for you? something uh, that was either uh, for on a memorable occasion or a wine that just blew your socks off, anything like that? Um, I guess there's a few. Uh, to, just to think of, uh, it's difficult for me to think of one particular um, moment regarding that, but I enjoy wine drinking. For me, it's more the occasion than the, the wine itself, um, enjoying it with friends or wine lovers one I think one particular um, moment that stands out was in way back just after I finished my studies Stellenbosch we went 
to uh, we, we as a group of still final final year students who so went overseas to Europe as for a sort of a study tour you can case you can call it and there in the in the Rhone Valley we we um, visited um, Jean Louis Schaaf in, in the Rhone Valley and the the Shirazes we tasted there really really impressed me so this is something I can remember tasting out of the barrels in at the domain um, John Louis Shaw. So that's one I can remember now of. But yeah, so there was a lot of other opportunities. I had some really, really great wines all over the world. But yeah, for me, it's more about the occasion than the wine. So having drunk lots of wines from around the world, um, other than South African wine, which other wine producing nation do you think really stands out for you in terms of quality? I think all nations, all countries have good wines. For me, there's, the, there's some regions within countries that stands out. I'm a big fan of Chateau Neuf de Pop wines. I'm a bit of a Rhone ranger. I, I love the Rhone style wines and the Rhone varieties. So that's one that definitely is my favorite, Chateau Neuf de Pop, the whites and the reds from, from that region. But further on, yeah, there's good wines all over the world. You just, <laughs> just need to find them. You mentioned earlier that um, your flagship wine is an SMV, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, how much does that wine cost? I can never remember the price of the top of my head. I think it's now at about 160 rand a bottle. Yeah, from, the, from our tasting room, it's about 160 rand a bottle. Yeah. That's a really, really good price. Tell me, Johan, um, of all the wines that you make in your cellar, which wine gives you the ma- most pleasure and the most satisfaction when you kind of make it and pick it in the vineyards? The one that just kind of always puts a smile on your face. Yeah, I, I like making all wines, but I think if I have to pick one wine, it is Grenache. I, I like Grenache. Um, making it, drinking it, um, for me, it's... I sort of have a bit of a love affair of, of Grenache, sort of a baby of mine, because way back in 2001, when I was um, working at um, what's now Piccaneer's Club Wines, of course, Piccaneer's Club is well known for their old wine, Grenache, up on the Piccaneer's Club Mountain. Um, actually, I was then a bit of a pioneering thing of me. I was the first person to, to bottle 100% Grenache in South Africa, way back just way back then it was called the Cardo Grenache 2001 was the first Grenache in South Africa that I was had the opportunity to make out of that old bush vines from the Piccaneer Grove area so since then yeah Grenache has always been sort of a, a baby of mine I actually tasted that Cardo Grenache just recently it's a it's a lovely wine um, tell me something what are your thoughts on wine critics, uh, wine scores, competitions? Do they have a place? Do they add value? I do think they add value. Um, it's yeah. I think there's obviously there's two schools about it. People that think it's not necessary, but from a marketing point of view, I think it does add value. Um, it obviously put you a bit out there to put you out and say, listen, you must you must rate this wine but I guess it's the same with being like a, a artist you put your painting out there if you put your if you're a singer you put your song out there if you're an actor and you put your the, your play out there you also you're going to open yourself to, to criticism but that that's part of it you, you have to do that that to to sell your product you have to be able to take criticism and learn from that as well so ratings does add a lot of value all ratings are not always good or let's say you can't always believe all ratings or all wine critics all of them have their own agenda as well so you will get maybe bad ratings for good wines or vice versa depending on who it was but yeah, I do think it does have a place yeah, just out of a pure marketing sense I think everyone has their own individual uh, flavor profile and taste profile and you know you kind of just have to find find your way around the tasters in particular especially the critics getting down to wine as a consumer do you prefer red white rosé cup classic bubbly 
what 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 works for you? I, th- I think it depends on the season. Normally, white wi- uh, white wines I will drink in summer. Red wines I'll drink in winter time. So yeah, for me it's seasonal. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm very much the same on that front. Tell me, wine pairing. It's something that everyone likes to try out at least. Um, what is your take on wine pairing? Would you kind of turn it on its head maybe sometimes and pair a white wine with red meat or a red wine with fish? How would you go about it? Yeah, I think personally I like pairings, um, doing it and experiment with it, experimenting with it at home or at our restaurant, at the, the farm as well. But yeah, for me it's if white wine works with, with red meat and red wine works with fish or whatever the case may be, why not? It's it's all about enjoying it. So, um, and you get so many different styles of white wine and styles of red wine. You get lighter red wines now, like for instance, a type of Grenache, for instance, you can make in a much lighter style. You can make all other red, or most other red varieties also in lighter styles. You can make heavier styles white, like with Chardonnay and with Viognier and all these type of varieties these days. So there's no reason why you can't enjoy if you can't have a good red wine or a good white wine with red meat or what the case may be so it's just a matter of experimenting and find finding out what that's what's working what can work yeah it's um it's something that you can have so much fun with mm. um definitely so i'm sure like me you've had times where you might have overindulged a little bit on the vinous front do you mind sharing your personal hangover cure tips? <clears throat> um, for me, just enough water. That I think that works the best. At, in the in the evening before you go to bed, make sure you drink a lot of water after you had, maybe had too much to drink, and then in the morning again, drink again, and drink a lot of water. All this. Don't think of all the other cures really work for me. Just enough water. That's that certainly is a, a theme that's coming through. Water, water, and a bit more water, especially before you go mm. to bed. That's uh, that's the trick. So, you're on your farm. Suddenly, lots of flashing lights are appearing, and a UFO lands with space aliens that are thirsty. What wine would you offer those space aliens to drink? Hopefully they they are friendly space aliens, um, are not coming to abduct you or do some experiments on you. Um, and I guess if they are friendly space aliens, I will serve them my best wine and try to be friendly with them and and um, enjoy the company. If they are not friendly, um, I think I'll try and give them the the t- bottle in my shallow with the highest alcohol maybe some spurs or something that can maybe that they can't digest <laughs> i like your t- your strategy there definitely a good one so each vintage is a different story um you know there's so many v- variables but would you say that there are more things that repeat themselves or the opposite i think there's more things that repeat themselves every year is different again all winemakers know you can't work with a, from a recipe, but you still have a basic recipe. So that's the sort of the thing that happens over and over every year. So at least, especially because you start to know your vineyards, you start to know the wines, you start to know your production, your processes. So there's a lot of things that definitely repeat itself every year. But again, you have to be um, vigilant enough to detect all the differences that, that come in through the season that you have to sort of work with and be sort of hands-on with that. Yeah, that makes sense. We've certainly had a couple of very interesting vintages these last couple of years where um, I think our winemaking talent has, has really been stretched a little bit in terms of knowing what to do mm-hmm. in the cellar. Uh, Do you have any good luck rituals or anything that you do during harvest that's a little bit out there? No, not really. No, I just get the job done. (laughs) 
And tell me, are there any things that you look out for at the beginning of harvest or just before harvest that might kind of give you an indication to the outcome of the harvest? I, I think it's just, uh, again, a matter of, of monitoring the, the vineyards um, from early on, see how the, how the growth are and how the bunches are developing and um, the color of your leaves, the amount of your leaves. So that that's sort of what I work on. And then from, from that, you make your decisions further on, on ripening and, and when to, when to harvest. So for me, just spending before harvest and during harvest, spending a lot of time in the vineyards, um, tasting grapes, looking at the grapes. And as I've told people before, while you're walking through the vineyards and tasting the grapes, you must think, okay, in three years time, this wine is going to be on the shelf. So what's going to happen with this bunch of grapes, this juice is coming out of this grapes during the next three years to have it on its peak when it's on the shelf. So basically you have to be like a wine prophet to predict what's going to happen in three years time with a bunch of grapes that you've got in your hands now. It's always the challenge. Who knows what the future holds? So uh, many winemakers have a very close and special relationship with their their vineyards and their vines and the grapes. Um, and some of them actually talk to their grapes and their vineyards. Do you talk to them? And if so, what do you say? No, I don't think I talk to my grapes or vineyards. I will maybe say some harsh words to the wines if something's not going right. But yeah, that's basically it. I can believe that. So some people read tea leaves in the bottom of a teacup. If you could read the future in the bottom of a red wine glass, what would it tell you? Um, hopefully it can tell me something about the, the, the next vintages coming up. So yeah, I don't, yeah, so for me, yeah, uh, you can't really predict the future, so you'll just, you just have to take it as it comes and make the best of it along the way. Indeed, if only we could tell the future. When you're not working, Johan, well, how do you spend your free time? Uh, I spend it with my family. Um, yeah, not much else than that. My, my family takes, my, they, um, takes up most of my time, so yeah, C- except for that, I do some jogging, or some cycling. Um, yeah, for that and I will, most of the time I will spend with my family or do a bit of handy, handyman work at home, but yeah, that's more or less that, boring life. <laughs> I don't think so. Family is key to a happy life, that's for sure. Certainly in my opinion, anyway. Do you listen to music? If so, what's, who's your favorite singer, artist, band, group? What's, what genres do you enjoy? I think I'm a bit, bit old school. I like the, the rock music of the 80s and 90s and even the 70s. So yeah, I think I'm a bit of a, of a rocker of, of the, that era. Um, the normal, say the big guys <clears throat> like Bruce Springsteen, Bon Jovi, um, Meatloaf, those type of, yeah, that's my music I would normally listen to, yeah. Some very cool bands in that lineup there. Um, do you have a favorite all time movie that you can just watch over and over again that just kind of either makes you happy or, or, or you just think it's so beautifully shot or acted? Hmm. There's a few, I think, um, a few come to, uh, coming to mind. There was one that I, it's quite an old movie, I think it's from the 1990s or even the 1980s. It was called Grand Canyon. I can't even remember the actors really in it. It's about people's life and how it affects one another. So it's quite a dramatic movie, more a very serious type of movie. <clears throat> but I really enjoyed that movie um, and how they went through their lives and everything that happens to them and so and then yeah I am actually I like action movies or actually I've got a sort of a, a soft spot call it a soft spot or a hard spot for 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 war movies I like war movies the action or the and normally the sort of the the sort of the that's based on true events um, the one movie I I I've watched a few times and I really enjoyed that movie was Black Hawk Down. It's also one of my favorite movies. 
That's very, very much one of the classic war movies for sure. Um, you're going out on a romantic evening. Beautiful setting, beautiful wine. Your one true love sits opposite you. What wine do you order? I guess it depends what's on the menu. <laughs> um, but yeah, normally, yeah, I would, I would normally, I if, when I when I'm at the restaurant and I go through the menu, I will order something that I don't know, just to something that I haven't drunk before. This again is just my sort of my I guess my pioneering spirit of experimenting and trying something new. So I would always go for something that I don't know first. If there's not that on the menu, then I guess I will go for something that I know that I'm comfortable with. Fair enough. Do you support any sports teams, rugby, soccer, anything like that? Who are they? And if that team or person were to win the World Cup or whatever it is, what bottle of wine would you give them as a gift, as a celebratory gift? Yeah, I'm a big sports fan. I, I, I like watching cricket and rugby. That's my two main sports that I watch. I don't really, I would say, support the provincial team, although I'm from the Western Cape, so I do would say more towards the Western Province or Stormers teams, obviously, but it's not set in stone. I obviously will support the Springboks and then the Proteas in the, in the case of, of cricket. That's my two main sports. Yeah, I, the only sort of clubs team that I really would support is Liverpool on the on the soccer side. I'm a big Liverpool fan for many years, and then I also keep my eye on Blackburn in the in the second league of of, of, the, of the of the English um, competition. Just because I also used to support them in the days of Alan Shearer. Um, but yeah, so I said, if they win, I was I. I I guess I would give them my best bottle of red wine that I do have. Maybe I'll is my the SMV from Wave Reels. If you were to give us any advice, what's the best bit of advice you would give someone? <laughs> um, I think the best advice you can give anybody is to always be true to yourself. Maybe it sounds corny, but that's I guess that's the way life goes, you have to always be, be true to yourself and um, respect other people and always try to treat people the way you would like to be treated. That is um, certainly a good motto to live by as well, for sure. What is your proudest achievement in at work? Um, I would say... Um, the thing that I'm proud of again, we've, we, um, earlier we talked about the Marshall Land. The whole Marshall Land project for me was quite, a, I think, a, a proud achievement because it was like a 12-year project just to first from getting the the first vine out of France into South Africa and get it through quarantine and get it multiplied and planted. So it was quite a, a long project and it was very fulfilling to get it, eventually see it finished and see the wine in the bottle. Um, and on the winemaking side also, it was in 2018 that um, again our SMV, our Shiraz Movedro Vionier of the 2013 vintage was awarded by International Wine Express Competition as the, the, um, the, the organic trophy, as the best organic wine in the world. So that was also quite a big achievement for us. So, and then, yeah, just I think being able to make wine every day of my life. <laughs> It really is an, a blessing to be able to do what you do and, uh, and, and just grow with the organization that you've been with for, for quite a number of years now. Complete the following sentence. A table without wine is like... A table without food. <laughs> Very good. I like that a lot. Um, a VIP is photographed in a restaurant with your bottle of wine on the table. Um, in your ideal mind, who is this VIP? Anyone in the world? And what was that bottle of wine that was on the table? Uh, that's a difficult question. Um, <clears throat> to be honest, 
I don't really care much about VIPs. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't, to be honest, I don't really have an answer for you. Uh, I, would, I guess any wine, any VIP that could sell the wine. <laughs> that's, that's the perfect um, opportunity, that's for sure. Uh, especially if they pepped by the paparazzis. Do you think we'll still be drinking wine in 2,000 years' time? Definitely, because they've been drinking wine for, what, 8,000 years now already, so what's another 2,000 years? I'm sure they will, really, the wine industry will be there forever. And what do you think will the wines be like in, say, 300 years' time? How will they look? How will they taste? What, how will they differ from what we're having today, do you think? Yeah, it's difficult to say, but I don't think there will be much difference. Obviously, there will be some new varieties, new cultivars, um, maybe some, I don't know how, much, how many, how you can change the styles, really. Um, but I, th- I've, I don't think over the few past few hundred years, wine changed that much, even maybe the, the white wines because of the, 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 the temperature control. But, uh, yeah, I think... Wine is such a traditional product, actually, and been that for that for centuries. People always enjoyed wine as part of a lifestyle for many centuries. I think that will continue. So I can't can't see that much change. She said there will some processes will change, some varieties will change, but I think it could be more or less the same. So those space aliens that landed at Waverly Hills a little while back, um, they turned out to be quite friendly and they loved your wine and they convinced you to go with them to outer space. But you're only allowed to take three bottles of wine with you to outer space. What three bottles of wine do you take? Um, I think I would take a... A sparkling wine, a white wine, and a red wine. Um, sparkling wine or champagne, I guess I would maybe something from Bollinger, maybe. Um, white wine, I think I would maybe take a, a Sauvignon Blanc from the Darling area. And uh, red wine, I would take a Chateau Neuf de Pop. I think you're going to have a great time in space with those selections. Tell me, uh, is there a winemaking area in the world that you'd like to explore? I had the fortunate enough to, to, to explore quite a few. Um, if there's others I would like to explore, I think I would like, maybe like to go to like the... Um, some regions, regions in, in Hungary or Romania, Moldova, that type of area. I think there's some really interesting wines and interesting cultivars. So that that would be one area I would like to explore more, maybe. Um, except for that, maybe South America, Uruguay. I think there's some really good wines coming out of Uruguay lately that I've tasted. So that's something I maybe also would like to explore. Yes, that's maybe so. Say that those two regions. Some bucket list experiences Mm. lined up there. Okay, I'm almost done, but before I finish, I'd like to play a little game with you. I'm going to name three different wine varieties, and I want you to tell me what song you would pair with each variety. The first one is Marshallan, the second one is Viognier, and the third one is Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah, no, I have to think very fast. Marshall Lan, I think I would... Um, I don't know why the songs are coming up in my head. Um, from Simon and Garfunkel, Bridge Over Troubled Waters. I don't know why, I just came, that just came into my head. So I guess that's then the Marshall Lan song. Vionier, um Now I'm thinking of Bruce Springsteen, Stafford and the rest. Just on the top of my head. I don't know why, but that's what I'm thinking of. Cabernet Sauvignon, I don't know. I'm thinking of something from Britney Spears. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know why, but yeah, I was, and let's say a Britney Spears song. That is quite an interesting combination. And uh, 
need to be added to your playlist, definitely, I think. Thank you so much, Johan Delport from Waverly Hills Organic for joining us today. Um, would you like to remind our listeners uh, where we can find your wines? Can they visit your tasting room? And please do share your website address. Yeah, firstly, our website is just waverlyhills.co.za. Um, yeah, our tasting room is open seven days a week. Um, Every single day, so yeah, you can buy your wines from there. All the wines are also available online. Um, we do have an online um, ordering system. So yeah, and further, it's we can find it at some retail shops all over the country. And um, yeah, but the easiest way is basically online. Um, we also have a very good restaurant on the farm that's open from Wednesday till Sundays. You can also come enjoy some really good food and you know, wines as well. Yeah, so everybody's welcome to come to Waverly Hills. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack South Africa. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.